we can get going. Brilliant. Okay, so I'll just check that I'm unmuted. Good, very good. So um, I'm going to welcome Nick Freyter for the, the second Truin lecture, which is uh, being co-hosted with the Friends of Humilla Society. And I believe Bob and many Friends of Humilla are here with us this evening. Um, <clears throat> Nick has had an illustrious career. He's, uh, I, I would say I have the pleasure of considering him a colleague, and, um, but uh, he's had a longer career than I have, so I wish I'd been able to work with him longer than I have, but most of the time he's been spent, um, his career was in, in America at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. But before that, Nick was, um, he studied his undergrad at the University of Aberdeen in geology. And then after that, I understand he was a fellow, was it Girton College in Cambridge? Yeah. All right. Um, you never actually revealed what you did there in Girton, but uh, I assume it was great paleontological things. And um, after that, that's when he went to, uh, to Virginia, where he was the director of the Natural History, Natural History Museum, I believe, or the director of research. And uh, but as well as holding that position, he had held some teaching positions, some uh, professorship, adjunct professorships there as well. Now, in 2007, he moved back to Scotland from the US to take on the role of Keeper of Natural Sciences at the uh, at National Museum of Scotland, where he, where he still is today. And um, <clears throat> may I say that I personally think that paleontology at the NMS is going from strength to strength, so I think he must be doing quite a good job there. But um, <clears throat> without further ado, we shall let Nick get on with his talk. And... Um, I challenged him beforehand to try and get in some Triassic fish. So I wonder if he'll be able to do that. But I'm sure he's got more interesting things to talk about than fish, given the title of Chip Shops and Drain Cleaners, The Weird World of the Triassic. So uh, we'll hand over to you then, Nick. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll see what we can do with those fish. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it is a, a great honor and privilege to have been asked to deliver uh, this second Nigel Turing Memorial Lecture. Nigel was always so excited about the world around him and in deep time, particularly, of course, anything to do with fishes. Uh, he was an, an enormous inspiration to others. And I just hope that uh, today I can capture a little of that same enthusiasm for you. And I'm having trouble getting my screen to go. There we go. So let's start with the very basics. Um, the Triassic world. Uh, here you see the geography of it, basically all the continents joined together to form this uh, single uh, supercontinent, Pangaea, with uh, the Sea of Tethys in this region. And as the name would suggest, it is obviously a tripartite division, uh, Lower Triassic, Middle Triassic, Late Triassic, but very unequal uh, uh, divisions, um, really only 4 million years for the Lower Triassic. Um, and that 4 million uh, year period uh, was after the end Permian extinction. And so it'll be important for us to get an idea of what went on in the Middle Triassic to see how quickly the world recovered uh, from that mass extinction. So my love affair with the Triassic and Pangaea started in this uh, Carboniferous quarry here. Um, uh, limestone quarry operated back in the day by Amy Roadstone. So it's slick stones or Cromhall quarry, and it contains a number of cave systems and these sort of classic uh, dissolution uh, fissure features uh, full of uh, Triassic sediments which have slumped into these, uh, these units. Now they have been known since the mid uh, 1900s, but as is the way with uh, large scale quarrying operations, new systems are always being exposed. And I was afforded the opportunity uh, to visit the quarry as part of Gordon Walkden's and Nigel Turin's honours field course to the south of England. I basically had a long weekend in the quarry to collect as much as I could. Uh, so novice geologists on their own in a working quarry for a weekend, what could possibly go wrong? 
but Nigel had exercised his duty of care. There was a pub within walking distance of the quarry, so I would be fine. Dropped off on a Friday, picked up on a Monday. What can I come back with? So, here I was, uh, a free man in uh, a quarry. Uh, it was a working quarry, but I was given free reign to operate over the whole of the weekend. Absolute heaven, collecting uh, crinoidal limestones and marls. And as you can see, there's bits of bone in here. This was a block that was collected uh, actually probably a, a decade later. And you can see, I hope, these uh, little white uh, circular bits and pieces. These are fragments of bone. And this is the hall from that one occasion. So having actively encouraged me to collect so much rock, Nigel forgot two very important things. It would need a lot of acetic acid to digest the rock. And I would be doing this in the lab right below his office. So I had up to, sorry, uh, I had up to eight or nine acid baths brewing at any one time. But I would know that when there was too much fizzing going on, when Nigel poked his head in the door and asked for a fish supper. And the smell of vinegar certainly pervaded that whole wing of geology in Marshall. But in my eyes, it was all well worth it a diverse array of small tetrapod jawbones. And I, you see a, a little selection here, um, absolutely beautifully preserved. This top one here, it's about nine millimeters long, slightly longer, that sort of size of a centimeter or so. But what is worth pointing out are these beautifully, uh, really exquisite articulation facets you can see. This is actually for one of the palate bones. Here's one of the, for the jugal, uh, the facial bone. We're looking on from the inside, outside uh, from this upper jaw bone. And here would have been the eye and a lower, a lower jaw, jaw bone in, in this region here. These are actually bones of rhynchocephalians. So what are rhynchocephalians? This is the Tuatala, the sole surviving member of this group, Sphenodon punctatus. Uh, lives on isolated islands off New Zealand, and its name, the common name, the Tuatala, is the Maori for uh, spiny back. So, Rhynchocephalia, as I say, that single living form, slow breeding, sexual maturity after 20 years, low metabolism, low body temperature, long lived, 100 years or so living on these few islands off New Zealand, and was this sort of putative living fossil. Why was it a putative living fossil? Well, it was labelled as such because of its presumed relationships to these guys, the rhynchosaurs. This has beak-like upper jaw here, you can see that uh, beak there. And also these battery of teeth here. Um, this was similar to some of the rhynchocephalians and reminiscent of the palatal teeth on them. So here it was uh, as this so-called living fossil, supposedly closely related to the, to the rhynchosaurs. Well, in actual fact, that's not the case. Uh, these things uh, are very special animals. They have the teeth fused to the summit of the jaw, this so-called acrodont dentition. Very key uh, features such as this is looking at one of the palate bones in ventral view, so we're looking up into the roof of the mouth. And uh, there's an enlarged tooth row here, uh, which is very characteristic of rhynchocephalians. Uh, one of these, uh, um, a thing called clevisaurs, which is from actually North America. But you can see this sort of beak-like thing, which was superficially very similar to the rhynchosaurs. But they also had this uh, extended process on the dentary, uh, a very pronounced uh, process, very characteristic of them. And uh, just looking at uh, one of the, the jaw bones, this is the, the lower jaw of a thing called Clevisaurus. You're looking at the outside, you can see these gouges uh, developed into the, past the teeth actually, here's the base of the teeth, and into the jaw bone itself. So these have a, a very precision shear bite, and they also characterize by these flanges on some of the teeth. 
So I had thousands of these isolated bones of new species, skull and postcranial, and the challenge for me was identifying them all and putting them back together again. Basically, I had a mixture of seven or eight uh, different jigsaw puzzles in various stages of completeness. They'd all been thrown together and the pictures completely discarded. So I was uh, really at a, a face with this dilemma and I knew that Bev Holster down in Reading had experience with these infills. And so I visited him, him in Reading to just discuss further my sort of initial feelings of how I should go about it. Bev's gift to me that day was this memoir by Rupert Vilt of Tanis to Fears, and it's become a sort of Bible for me. And as you can see, here's a, a slab of Tanis to Fears, and we'll come back to this later, uh, with the isolated uh, jaw bones around here, but also uh, cranial elements. This is the nasal, there's a bit of a pterygoid bone. Here I could see how had someone else gone about doing it. And so this was my Bible for the, uh, the rest of my, uh, under, uh, my graduate studies. And I started to put together uh, some of the reconstructions of these animals. This is a thing called Clevisaurus, uh, which you've seen also already. And this is Sphenodon on the right, so Clevisaurus on the left. So I did have the living form to, to go with. So it was somewhat uh, uh, helpful, but I started to describe a whole array of different uh, species of rhynchocephalians from these fisher fields. And when later on we did find some uh, articulated uh, specimens, it was great and gratifying to see that my reconstructions of these animals were largely correct. Uh, so my jigsaw puzzle skills uh, were reasonable. So over the last couple of decades, we've come to know a lot more about rhynchocephalians, and there's actually a huge diversity of forms. There's these sort of aquatic forms, pleurosaurs. Um, there's this larger animal, Priosphenodon. Uh, there's an animal called Sphenovipera, which was possibly venomous. Toxalophosaurus and Ilenodon from the Jurassic and uh, Lower Cretaceous of North America. Uh, have these in very enlarged, uh, transversely broadened teeth, and we think they were herbivores. So much greater diversity than represented actually even here. And it may even have been a radiation to somewhat uh, um, compete with the radiation of this group here, the squamates, the lizards and snakes. Rhynchocephalians are actually the sister taxon. Uh, to uh, the, the squamates, to lizards and snakes. And uh, I think there's no reason to assume that they were living uh, fossils. There's such a great diversity of, of forms there. Now, other components of the fisher fields, which I came across uh, in my uh, dissolution of these, these fills included a variety of tetrapods such as uh, crocodilians. Now, this is a crocodilian, believe it or not. Think called Terrestrosuchus, definitively a crocodile, has a number of characteristics, particularly of the pneumatic, uh, pneumaticity of the skull bones, um, various features of the brain case, but they were active cursorial animals. And also various uh, mammals are, are found in some of the fisher fills. These were more from uh, younger fills in, in Wales. But nevertheless, we had um, a, a vast array of different uh, groups here. Essentially, actually, modern tetrapod groups, but very different from their modern day forms. So I was very much of the thinking, even at this early stage in my research, that the Triassic had its own very peculiar faunas, far removed from those of today. But I needed to experience more Triassic. What do we know about the Pangaean interior? So although coined on the basis of the Germanic sequences, or the German sequences, for some, the classic Triassic sequences are in the American Southwest. This is Petrified Forest National Park. These beautiful uh, exposures of Triassic sequences yield all sorts of wonderful animals. 
Aita sores, things like uh, Dismatasuchus at the bottom, uh, here with its body armor and here with the body armor sort of taken off. There's a whole array of forms, Typothorlax, Palatipothorlax. Stagnolepis from the Lossimouse sandstone formation is another good example of one really close to home. And I implore you all to go and visit the wonderful Elgin Museum uh, to learn more about Stagnolepis. Uh, so these aetosaurs are very, very ubiquitous in the Triassic world, uh, but very common, particularly in uh, Petrified Forest National Park. Other Triassic animals known from the time, uh, phytosaurs, these crocodile-like animals, we have long-snouted, gharial-like forms, a uh, bit more robust animals too. Very different to crocodiles in the positioning of the nostrils. They were here, uh, very close to the orbit, not at the end of the snout, but right here and the same here too. Very uh, abundant, particularly in Northern Hemisphere uh, deposits of the Triassic. But in my efforts to sort of reunite Pangaea, I wanted to look somewhat closer to home than Arizona, Arizona and New Mexico. What about the Eastern US? And here we've got a bit of a, either a concrete jungle, here's New York and over just on the other side, uh, New Jersey and the Newark Basin here. And further south, we've got real jungle, uh, this sort of swamp, uh, tick infested, poison ivy infested uh, uh, outcrops or potential outcrops to, uh, to look for. So I was interested to see what similarities might have been in the Fisher Fields here to down here, but also in North Africa, Iberian Peninsula. These are the areas very close together in Triassic times. So what was going on there? Well, just as in the UK, large building projects are the key to finding the Triassic in Eastern North America. Uh, this is Culpeper Stone Quarry up in Northern Virginia, which produces these wonderful uh, dinosaur theropod uh, trackways. Here, Dulles Airport uh, sits bang, smack on the Triassic. And uh, I spent some happy days uh, in the road cuts as they're extending uh, from I-66 uh, onto the approach road, as, uh, road to Dulles. Uh, collecting all sorts of uh, interesting footprints. Here's a little thing, a little Ornithodarlin print, probably about one and a half centimeters long. But we found some beautiful phytosaur footprints too, with scales right here, very close uh, to, to Dulles Airport. So this is the key to the success in, uh, in the East. And it's not just footprints, uh, body fossils. This is Coahomasuchus, one of those aetosaurs here in dorsal view and in ventral view, this sort of beautifully armored animal, a bit armadillo-like. Um, and this is from uh, North Carolina for one of the brick quarries there. However, this is the love of my life, or was for a time, the Virginia Solite quarry. Sits here, aerial view. Uh, this is the North Carolina, Virginia state line. To the uh, right there is Virginia, and this is North Carolina. Sits bang smack in the middle of tobacco growing country. Right here, here we are, the Dan River, Dan, uh, uh, Danville Basin. And here we see these beautiful cyclical sequences, these uh, repetitive sequences of uh, lacustrine deposits, deep lakes shallowing up and then deep lakes again, these so-called Milankovitch cycles. Just as Nigel had waxed lyrical about his work in the Orcadian Basin, you see these same uh, cyclical uh, sequences. And I had obviously picked up a thing or two from Nigel about such sequences and so felt comfortable in this new setting, very different obviously to the Fisher Fields. And at the time, thanks to the work of Paul Olson, Solite was best known for this small aquatic reptile, Tani Trachylos. Um, you can see here the long neck. Uh, um, it's about 30 centimeters long, something like that. Uh, and from trackways and some specimens with soft part uh, preservation, we even know that it had webbed uh, feet. Here's the elongate neck, and the arrows are pointing to a very characteristic plow-shaped 
uh, ribs, which are on the neck. So these animals have ribs, not just uh, as well in the abdomen, but in thorax, but obviously in the neck as well. And this actually, Tani Traclos, as the name might uh, hint at, is the sister taxon to my great friend, Tani Sophias. So once again, I felt that I was in my comfort zone and here Rupert's built Bible was following me around once more. Here is Tani Sophias, the skull of Tani Sophias, and here's one of the elongate, very elongate, as we'll see in a bit, neck vertebrae. But back to Tani Sophias, this is Callan Carr's wonderful restoration of this small aquatic uh, reptile, freshwater uh, uh, aquatic reptile. Believing there had to be many more vertebrates here, I set to excavating the site much more extensively. Very hard work excavating in these temperatures around 100 and humidity to match. But uh, sitting in the sun too long was how Paul Olson described it when I said, this is a really cool reptile. This is one of the slabs I pulled out. And I don't know if you can even see the, the ridges here, but I could see for me what were uh, hints at least of potential limbs there as well as ribs. But again, as I say, Paul thought I had been out in the, in the sun for far too long until Several years later, we got it to the Penn State uh, CAT scan uh, facility. And here, there's uh, the slab, and this is in the same orientation. Here's the skull, a long neck. Coming down here, we can see the back limbs here, front limbs, and these elongate ribs. So here was our first uh, new reptile. Uh, and a second specimen I found several years later, once again, you can see skull here, long neck, and these elongate ribs. This we called Machistus Trachelos, and here's Karen Carr's uh, reconstruction of it in all its glory. Very unusual for this long neck. So again, very uh, 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 reminiscent of Tani Trachelos and Tani Sophia's. I am still not sure whether it is actually uh, closely related to those forms or not. Other forms, this is Icarosaurus, Icarosaurus from the Newark supergroup, um, same age, uh, practically uh, contemporaneous with the Solite uh, fills. Uh, and again, elongate uh, ribs here, which we think like Draco, the modern day flying dragon, the flying lizard, uh, supported a patagium that uh, held this membrane for gliding. But unlike Machistotrachlis, a short neck, much more like Lepidosaurs, the snake, uh, the, the, the lizard, sorry. Although it is not a lizard. So with the aid of further support from National Geographic and NSF, we conducted some major excavations over several years. And this exposed the most fossiliferous unit in the quarry, which was just about one foot thick, sort of lying in here. And so we started to work back uh, the beds from the, from the top of the quarry here. And these are my colleagues of the time, and the names probably don't mean much to vertebrate paleontologists for a reason. This is Dave Grimaldi, Michael Engels, and Vlad Blagodorov, who's Vlad, Vlad is now actually at uh, NMS in, in Edinburgh. Dave at the American Museum of Natural History and Michael Engel in Kansas. And it was time for me to move substances away from acid and onto alcohol because you probably can't see much here, but these are the sorts of interesting fossils that we started to find there. Um, you can see, I hope, little uh, white dots here. These are concosticans, slam, clam shrimps. But with alcohol on the surface and a ring light, these little fragments of silvery uh, uh, bits and pieces start to pop out as clear, unadulterated insects. This is an orthopteran uh, getting on for a, a centimeter long. You can see its long hind limb here. Here's the femur, uh, the head, antennae. Absolutely wonderful preservation. We also found blattoids, cockroaches, 
This thing on the right here, uh, about 4.5 millimeters long, that's all. But still with beautiful preservation, the cerci here, the wings, this is another form, a somewhat larger one, about nine millimeters long from the tip of the head to the end of the, the abdomen. Other forms, macopterans, uh, the so-called scorpion flies, orthopterans, again, the, these are alcanids, but beautiful preservation, even with pigment uh, coloration or the pigment markings that you can see on the wings here. Absolutely remarkable. And then nothing more uh, impressive than the dipterans, at least eight families, four of them living. Uh, these are the tipulids here, the, the crane flies. There's the psychodids, psychodomorphs, the moth flies. And we even have a culicomorph. Uh, this is, uh, we believe, the first blood sucking insect known. It's from the Triassic, 225 or so million years old. Bellostomatids, water bugs. You see these today, giant water bugs. This thing's about uh, 50 millimeters long. Uh, again, beautifully preserved with the, the sort of oar-like uh, back limbs and you get these sort of uh, uh, hair-like uh, impressions on them. Net uh, work of uh, venation patterns on the, on the wings here. Maybe over a thousand specimens from the site. Really remarkable. And my favorite, Thysanopterans. They're probably the bane of many gardeners' lives today. Uh, Thysanopterans, thrips, uh, eat roses, the rosebuds, and they'll eat uh, uh, fruit blossoms. This animal from the Solite Quarry, here's a modern one, uh, from the Solite Quarry, 1.1 millimeters from the tip of the head there to the bottom of the, the abdomen but complete with the wings preserved with these fringe-like margins to it, just like the modern one. Incredible preservation. Also, not just insects, other uh, terrestrial arthropods. Here's an Araneomorph spider. So my view of the Triassic was beginning to evolve considerably. Uh, and until uh, Solite, uh, probably one of the most prolific areas for Triassic insects was the Madigen formation of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, here's, here's the sort of exposures there. And this is one of my excuses for displaying Doug Henderson's wonderful artwork. This is a Titanopteran wing from uh, the uh, Madigen, about nine inches long. So these were magnificent uh, animals, gigantic animals, uh, nothing uh, left alive today. These were just Triassic uh, forms. We have not yet uh, found such uh, wonderful insects in the uh, Solite though. But why I really wanted to uh, start sharing something about uh, the Madigen was a couple of weird tetrapods that have been found there. This is Shalovitrix. And Doug Henderson's restoration of Shalvitrix. Here's its hind legs. And in there is this membrane. This was another gliding reptile, but it supported the gliding membrane, not by its ribs, but by its hind limbs. And then this weird animal, just a single specimen from the Madigen, uh, called Longisquema. And Doug's restoration of a, a dead one uh, at the, in the um, leaf litter almost here, being preyed on by various uh, insects. It has this weird array of uh, leaf-like appendages down the, the, the back. And we have no idea what they're for. for. Uh, what was the purpose? What was the function? We don't know what longest squarma is uh, related to. But here is a real uh, conundrum for us. We are starting to see some really weird animals. Now, at this stage in my work on the Solite vertebrates, I needed to get a better understanding of Tanisophids, which naturally brought me to the Alps and to the, the western side of Tethys. Here, Monte San Giorgio, this is the Lago di Lugano. Um, and here, uh, so up in here in Switzerland, we're in Italy over here. This is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site now. Why is it a UNESCO World Heritage Site? 
Well, it has incredible uh, preservation, various fishes, which I'm sure Nigel would have approved of my interest here, but also pachypleurosaurs, uh, nothosaurs, uh, placodonts, a variety of uh, aquatic um, tetrapods. And these uh, uh, mini sort of uh, Loch Ness monsters, these pachypleurosaurs, are, are, are particularly abundant. And of course, Canis tophias. So what do we know about Canis tophias? So this is the first I've really revealed of a complete skeleton. <clears throat> this is the neotype of Canis tophias uh, uh, longobardicus. The skull here, about five millimeters, five centimeters sorry, long. Here's its neck, running all the way down here. 13 neck vertebrae, incredibly elongated. Here's the body and then the top end of the tail. And of course, these sorts of reconstructions that you start to see, I quite like this one. This is on the, the wall at the, the Zurich Museum. But you start to see some rather weird restorations. Could it have actually put its neck up and elevated it like that? Seems implausible to me, but hey, there's all sorts of uh, weird fantasies going on. Uh, you know, could it really hide amongst the crinoid stems? Was it really able to do this? Uh, for my part, I, I find this very difficult to believe because it had these uh, neck vertebrae, uh, sorry, neck uh, ribs that overlapped and for, formed these stiffen, stiffening bundles. I just do not see it being able to bend its neck in such a S-shaped uh, uh, curve, but who knows? Let's have a look at the anatomy in a little more detail and a little bit more about uh, some of these different forms. Um, <clears throat> is there more than one species? This is Tanis sophias meridensis, uh, so-called, and uh, Longobardicus here. It was once proposed that uh, there were these two species simply because this is younger than that. But they're very crushed uh, fossils and purported differences were in ratios of, uh, of uh, the various skull bones differing. And that's impossible to say, you know, because you can't say where the uh, broken bones started and ended. So for me, there's nothing uh, different about this from that. And so Tanis tophias meridensis is a junior synonym of Longobardicus. But the so-called uh, juvenile forms are a bit different. Here's uh, a maxilla, about four, uh, um, uh, about four, no, no, mm, two centimeters long. And a much uh, larger form here, a uh, much bigger uh, maxilla, the, the skull of this animal would have been more like uh, uh, a foot long something in that region. But these so-called juveniles have got tricuspid teeth on them, as opposed to these uh, big, uh, um, sharp, uh, conical uh, fish. You could see these were fish uh, eating uh, teeth. It was proposed by Rupert that the juveniles were insectivores, so-called juveniles were insectivores, and the larger ones, they went out to sea, the adults went out to sea and, 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 and ate fish. But very early on, when I started to examine the specimens in Zurich, I felt there were some clear anatomical differences between the large and smaller forms. So here's the, the pre-maxilla, uh, the front, the snout of one of the larger forms. Here's the right, there's the left side. Here's one of the smaller forms. And you can see a very different shape. Here's the nasal and the nostril, the external nares here. Uh, here it's confluent. And I felt there were some clear an anatomical differences and these could not be put down just to ontogeny. But we were faced with the perennial problems that I had faced with the Fisherfields, 3D jigsaw puzzles and also working with real flat packs. They had been crushed flat. Difficult creating 3D renditions with uh, compressed fossils. This is Stefania Nassotti's admirable restoration though. And I find this quite compelling for the junior form, uh, the, the juvenile form. But of the, the larger specimens, a couple, and this one in particular, uh, although somewhat flattened, at least the skull bones are partially disassociated, and it turns out that they are still preserved three-dimensionally. 
CT scanning once again came to the rescue. And thanks to Stefan Speakman for the amazing renditions uh, of the skull that you see here. And I think it's very obvious that in the big, large forms, there's a very different shape to the juvenile. And uh, at the same time, looking at the histological studies of the long bones in the smaller forms, we can see lines of arrested growth indicating that the smaller specimens were actually mature individuals. And we now think that the larger form uh, of Tanya Sophias that was originally described by Rupert Vilt as the adult is a completely different uh, taxon, which we've called Tanis sophius hydroides. And the smaller form is uh, a mature individual in its own right. Uh, and that these two forms, here we are, just to give you some idea of size. Uh, here's Longobardicus and here's hydroides. And you can see a very different shaped skull in hydroides. And we think that uh, these two forms uh, extraordinary forms live side by side in the ancient sea of Tethys, and uh, there must have been some niche partitioning uh, with them. Now, before moving on, I just want to mention Macrocnemus. Uh, Macrocnemus is another long necked tetrapod in the Monte San Giorgio deposits, and here's Doug Henderson's wonderful restoration of it. Clearly, you can see from the hind limbs here and the forelimbs and well-developed uh, feet and, and, and uh, hands, clearly uh, well adapted to life on, a tourist, on, the, on land, maybe uh, a coastal uh, environment that is where it lived. But we'll, we'll come across this animal in a, bit, in a minute. I'm now wanted to move to Eastern Tethys in my bid to reunite Pangaea. What was living uh, in this part of the world, both on land and in the water? First, Liaoning province, and this is up in northeastern China, famed for the Yixian formation, the feathered dinosaurs, beautiful birds with feathers, and also wonderful insects and plant remains. But right in the middle of these Yixian uh, outcrops in Liaoning province is the Yankagao village and a wonderful little spot for continental Triassic. And I was keen to see what secrets it might hold. It's a very difficult area to farm with all these Triassic exposures. And right there within the village, uh, as I think uh, you can see here also, um, this is all Triassic. Triassic heaven, as far as I was concerned. Farmers live a very uh, difficult existence, but they are such wonderful people and also willing helpers in our excavations. And with my colleagues from the Geological Museum of China and my good friend, uh, Brian Axsmith. Uh, this is Brian here. Uh, Brian is a graduate student, was a major contributor, a contributor to my work in the Solite Quarry. Uh, tragically, I have to say that uh, Brian succumbed to COVID-19 uh, earlier this year, and it's a, a sad loss for paleobotany uh, that we lost this remarkable uh, and gifted uh, paleontologist uh, to COVID. But we uh, found a variety of interesting plants, very similar to actually to ones that we had recovered in uh, Solite, horsetails, ferns, a variety of ferns and cycadophytes, but unfortunately no insects and also no uh, tetrapods. So feeling a little bit uh, miffed by that, my attentions uh, were moved more to southern China into Guizhou province down in the south and at the invitation of, of Dai Yong Jiang from uh, Peking University, and Li Chun from the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, I started to, to work together with them uh, in uh, some of the middle Triassic outcrops here. Here in Yunnan province, um, here's one of the outcrops, beautiful uh, exposures yielding things like Mixosaurus, this uh, ichthyosaur. This is uh, part of the so-called Loping uh, fauna. But 
elsewhere there in uh, Yunnan and also in uh, Guizhou, we find an array of classic pachypleurosaurs, nothosaurs, placodonts, and yes, Tom, just for you, these are pretty cool fish, aren't they? Sauroxes. Uh, Sauroxes, actually, I failed to uh, say earlier, does occur in Monte San Giorgio. So the Triassic had some uh, wonderful and rather weird looking fish too. But for me, it's the, the, the wonderful uh, tetrapods, placodonts, just like in Monte San Giorgio and huge nothosaurs uh, with these fish trap like uh, teeth uh, lining uh, the jaws. And Macrocnemus. Uh, Macrocnemus, somewhat different to the one in Monte San Giorgio, slightly different leg proportions, but unquestionably uh, the same uh, sort of, uh, of animal as the one in uh, Monte San Giorgio, and potentially Tanistrophius hydroides. Unfortunately, we do not have the skull of this particular animal, but I could see no difference between the uh, postcranial skeleton here. Uh, of the form from China in Guizhou province and the ones that we were finding in uh, Monte San Giorgio. However, there is a very different drain cleaner, one with an even longer neck. This is Dinocephalosaurus. This is the skull of Dinocephalosaurus. And here is one of the referred specimens. Dinocephalosaurus has 33 neck vertebrae. Much more obviously an aquatic animal with flipper-like limbs. And here is uh, the most spectacular specimen in my mind. So here's the skull. Here's the neck coming around here. All the, oops, sorry. All the uh, uh, vertebrae, the individual vertebrae. The neck comes along here, comes along through here, up to here, and here is the forelimbs. A bit of a weird impression it gives. These are not the forelimbs, these are the hind limbs. The neck extends all the way up here, and then it does a loop the loop. Here's the, the thorax and abdomen, and here's the tail. This thing, when unraveled, would have been about 5.5 uh, meters long. Remarkable animal. And yes, this was living in the sea with Tanistrophius begs all sorts of questions about their biology. Not least, how did they breed? Um, there are specimens known. Uh, here you can see millimeter uh, intervals here. Here's uh, the neck vertebrae, elongated neck vertebrae, little tiny limb uh, elements here. This is sitting inside one of these huge animals. Did it give birth to live young? However, we've also found this egg-shaped, I think this was lined by a membrane. This is also a dinocephalosaur, but it's not dinocephalosaurus. Here's the skull, here's the neck. Actually only has 24 neck vertebrae. So very different to dinocephalosaurus. And here's the, the rest of the animal here. So we are seeing a whole array of different forms here in China. Another one, pectidens, maybe not quite so weird. Here you can see the skull tucked in here behind its back legs, the neck, elongated vertebrae, very like macrocnemus, like tanisophias. And then the body comes back here and the tail. However, there are some features about this animal, uh, particularly in the, the hip, which is much more akin to Dinocephalosaurus. And so we're starting to see uh, an array and a radiation of these strange aquatic uh, and terrestrial animals in China. And then there's a Topa dentatus. Where do we even begin with this guy? Um, this is the skull. Uh, and the, the end of the snout is developed into this strange hammer uh, head. The topodentatus, here's our reconstruction. This is it in dorsal view. This is where the orbit was, the eye. 
here in ventral view of a different specimen. And here, I, once again, is this blunt hammer-headed snout right at the end of the snout. If you look at it, it's got chisel-shaped teeth here along the end. And if you can see here, along the margins of the jaw, you've got these needle-shaped uh, uh, teeth packed so closely together. There's absolutely hundreds of them in there, right the way along the jaw margins. When faced with a strange flattened fossil, the best thing to do is try and model it in 3D. So, a visit to Carrefour across the road from IVPP, find some plasticine and toothpicks. And this is how uh, Olivier Riepel uh, and I came up with our hypothesis about its eating habits. We reconstructed. Uh, so here's the dentary. This is the lower jaw. We put the, the teeth in here. We uh, lay them in there. We put together the, uh, the upper jaw, the, uh, the maxilla here, and also the premaxilla, and put them together. How could this thing eat? What was it going to do? Well, we decided that the, the likely, most likely thing was the chisel-like uh, teeth along the front edge was used, it would have used it to nibble away uh, at algae on rocks, put that into suspension, scrape it off the rocks in that, uh, sort of, uh, in, and put it into that suspension in the water, then suck it in and then filter feed it uh, by pushing the water out through that array of a uh, sieve-like array of the, the needle shaped teeth. We don't know but that is our best interpretation for this guy. What else is there? Turtles on the half shell. Turtles on the half shell, why the half shell? This is in ventral view, Odontochelis. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the earliest turtles, doesn't have a dorsal callipus, completely devoid of it. Another form, Eorhynchochelis. Um, no callipus whatsoever. Broadly, uh, transversely broadened uh, ribs. You can see the, the shape of the, the ribs and how um, it would look like it would support uh, a shell, but it, it did not exist. But the, uh, the skull is unquestionably uh, like a turtle. It has the beak there, edentulous anterior end, although teeth in the, uh, the back end of the, the jaws. But other features of uh, the, the hip and uh, the limb bones, very, very turtle-like. So we have these turtles also living in uh, Eastern Tethys. And of course, uh, in the, um, uh, the Triassic, there are um, fully uh, calipased and plastroned, if you will, uh, turtles. This is Proganochelis, uh, actually from Germany, and here you do see uh, the very obvious um, turtle callipus and uh, uh, the plastron here in this annual. So, very uh, conventional turtles too. And this brings me back to where I came in, recognizing that in addition to the Heath Robinson contraptions in the Triassic, there were also the most basal forms of modern animal groups living together. Now, at face value, it would seem that Eastern Tethys was rather different to the Western part. But were they really so different? I'm not so sure that will ultimately prove to be the case. And this is the reason why this museum here. This is the new Xingyi Field Museum in Guizhou province. It was built over, this was the exposure as I saw it in 2010. This was a quarry to excavate fossils. And now you can see the same exposure covered in this uh, museum. There are a number of places in China being exposed like this. So over the last decade in China, there has been much, much more rock exposed and split for fossils than the whole of the last 100 years in the Alps. And the more you search, the more you find. And so I am wondering if 
we are just missing the hammerheads, the dinocephalosaurs from uh, Montezan, Georgia. I don't know. However, the Triassic is clearly a mix of the ancient and modern. It ranges from peculiar groups with no descendants beyond the Triassic, so things like Topodentatus, Dinocephalosaurus, Shallovipteryx, Longisquama, also some animals which I hadn't previously mentioned, Japanosaurs, these weird animals, and of course the Tanistrophids. Alongside a whole array of vertebrates and invertebrate groups that are still very much part of our world, including, of course, the dinosaurs. So why did certain groups die out at the end of the Triassic while others made it through? Triassic began with a major extinction event and apparently also ended with a bang. There, are, there is evidence for large bolide impacts in the late Triassic, although not maybe quite at the, the end of the Triassic, uh, sort of in the, the Carnian to, to Northern with uh, bolide impacts like the Manicoagan um, and Red Wing uh, in Detroit area. But there's also camp. Camp is the largest magnetic, magmatic province known, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, much bigger than the Deccan and Siberian traps. So there's all sorts of uh, catastrophic events potentially going on right then at, at the end of the Triassic. So the foundations were somehow laid for the beginning of the modern world. We lost these weird things but certain groups uh, made it through. But that is a whole new talk. So there's obviously many people that I, I want to thank, uh, and here's a, an array of them. Of course, uh, Nigel Turin, uh, I have to thank for the inspiration that he undoubtedly gave me throughout uh, my career at Aberdeen and also beyond. And I hope that you have enjoyed what is really a whirlwind tour of the Triassic and that it will just stimulate you to learn a little bit more about deep time and uh, the amazing world that surrounds us. Thank you.